So I'm obviously not Jer Jeremy because I'm not as handsome and as young as he is, right? And uh, welcome to those who are streaming online as well. Jeremy gave me a, contacted me on Thursday and he said, I'm getting, I'm getting better, but I sound like Louis Armstrong. So I can't preach. So he said, can you do it? And I said, of course. I'll be glad to stand in. So I, I, I didn't have time to put together PowerPoint and all that kind of stuff, but since I've preached for about 50 years, I should be able to pull up something, right? And um, so we're going to continue in that series we've been doing on answering questions from the, the congregation. So why don't you stand just for a quick moment. Just, we'll just stretch a little bit and uh, let me pray. And then we're going to get into the subject of heaven. And three questions that were asked back in November, December about the subject of heaven. And it's my privilege to uh, share a few insights about that. Lord, I pray you would open both my understanding and all of our ears to the realities of eternity and all that that means. Lord, we confess that we're brainwashed by our culture. There's much confusion on a lot of different things, but there's probably nothing more stable and secure than eternal life with you. And I pray you'd open our minds to that today and may it become one of the great hopes of our life of spending eternity with you because of our faith in Jesus who died to pay for our sins to allow us to be reconciled to God. Lord, what an incredible thing. Help us wrap our minds around it today. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. I do want to recognize as I start here, we do have a resident expert on heaven who's in the audience today. Marcus, could you stand up, please? Uh, he's our resident expert. And... Uh, <clears throat> Marcus teaches a regular class, actually, on heaven, and uh, with the book by Randy Alcorn, which is probably the best one ever written. I think there's over a million copies in print. It's called Heaven, and I really encourage you to get it. I actually asked my first question about heaven when I was nine years old, because my dad took my brother and I into our bedroom and with tears streaming down his cheeks, he said to us, I was a nine-year-old, my brother was 11, he said, Mama's not coming home. Our mother had died unexpectedly. And I remember then, as a nine-year-old, wondering if there was a heaven. And then spending the next 60 years studying it, thinking about it, and coming to the absolute conclusion that I was going to see my mother again one day in heaven. Amen? By the way, I've been given another really wonderful mother too. She's in the front row right here. Could you stand up, Mom? Just, just stand up. Come on. I have two mothers. <laughs> That's a blessing too. I do want to mention that uh, Jeremy sent me his notes for this message, and they were tremendous, so I'm going to incorporate a lot of ideas into, from him into it. Back in November, December, you guys asked three specific questions about heaven, and they were this. Where is heaven? What is heaven like? And why isn't there more about heaven in the Bible? Okay, well, my answer to all three of those questions is, I don't know. No, just kidding. Uh, I'll close in prayer and we'll have a good day. No. <clears throat> um, let, me, let me set it up this way. The idea of the hope of heaven is utterly crucial to a human life. It was just this week that the CDC came out with a national study. Now, we don't quite believe them as much as we used to, but it, it, it was a good study related to uh, young people. And in that study, they said that 57%, this is today, right now, 57% of girls, young girls, school-age girls, are sad a lot, they have been depressed, and have contemplated suicide. 57% of young girls today. That means there is no hope 
in, in a lot of different ways. In fact, just to kind of give you a quick little mini teaching here, by the way, I, I would encourage you to take notes if you have paper, but I also, we're going to make available my own notes afterwards for those who'd like a copy to go home and study. Because I'm going to give you a lot. I've got to go really, really fast and through a few things, but I think it'll be important to you. But this is kind of a little quick mini teaching for you that I've given all over the world that kind of came to me many years ago, and it's basically this. We, we have peace and purpose in our lives when three things are kind of stable. The first one is we have a sense of our past, our heritage, and where we came from. We also then have a peace or a sense about who we are and what we're supposed to do on this earth in the present. But we also have a hope and a stability and a peace about where we're going, which is the future, heaven. So kind of imagine that as a three-legged stool, you know, that's stable because you know where you came from and you have peace about your past. If you've got to bury a number of things, you've got peace about it. You, you know what you're supposed to be doing in the present. You're, you're using your talents and your gifts as much as you can for the glory of God. And you're perfectly secure in where you're going, which is eternity with Jesus. It's when you have those three things, you are at peace and have purpose. I, I call that the triad of destiny, these, these three things. And what we learn from this study is, and it's obvious, we're, we're teaching a whole generation of young people, there's no God, there's no this, there's no that, and they are depressed, and they're committing suicide, and there's no hope of heaven because they have not been introduced to the reality of God, faith in Him, their sins being forgiven by Jesus, and the hope of eternal life. We need to give that generation hope today. Amen? And that's our job. That's part of in evangelism, is to simply to be able to lift them up. By the way, if you're studying this, Jesus, like in everything, is the perfect example of peace about the past, present, and future. And you find that in John 17. John 17, right? Write that down. Where Jesus mentions he knew where he came from, and then he said to his father, I've accomplished the things you asked me to do. So there's the, he was using his present gifts properly. And then he also said, and now, Father, I'm returning to you. So he knew where he came from, he knew what he should do, and he knew where he was going. So he had perfect purpose, and peace. That can be true in our lives as well. Okay, at this point, I kind of want to back up a little bit and go to the big picture, the big picture related to heaven. Because in today's world, the world we live in, primarily the Western world, there are two common lies or misconceptions about heaven. Two. One of them comes from kind of a these are lazy thinkers or liberal believers, and the other comes from atheists or secular people. The first lie is that all people go to heaven at death. And you hear that phrase often from people all the time when, when a person's suffering and they die and the person says, well, they're in a better place. Well, they may be in a better place, but they actually may be in a worse place. The Bible does not teach all people just kind of automatically go to heaven for any reason. That's, that's a false idea. That's not reality. And, and the second idea is just as bad. The atheistic idea, and these are two different poles, really. The atheistic idea is that we all just kind of die like animals and there's no conscious life after death. And that's a lie, too. That when you die, the lights go out and there's nothing after that. Or that everybody, regardless of how they lived or what they believed, are going to be in a beautiful place called heaven. Both of those are lies. They're misconceptions. They're not true. Let me kind of just quickly lay out for you the reality, the backdrop behind heaven. And then I'm going to go specifically into the three questions. The, the background is this. I'm going to make two, two statements to kind of frame this for us. The first one is this. There is a God who created the heavens and the earth. 
He made moral beings, beings that can choose right and wrong. That's angels and humans. With a desire to share an eternal love relationship with them. That is a fact. There are moral beings called angels. There are moral beings called human beings that God ultimately wants to, he'd love to share an eternity with. And that eternity will joyously take place for the righteous angels and for repentant, believing humans in a place called heaven. Okay? So that's truth number one of reality. The second part of reality is this. Some of the angels, not all of them, but all human beings have rebelled against God. That's what the Bible calls the fallenness, of course, of human beings. And those who refuse to repent and believe and give God his rightful place in their lives will be separated from God's presence and other redeemed folk forever. That's what the Bible teaches. That is the reality. And, of course, we call this place hell, which was originally created for Satan and his demons. Did you know, by the way, that in the Bible, Jesus tells us more about heaven than any other person. He also tells us more about hell than any other person because he understood it better than any other person being the creator and the savior. It was Jesus who said in Matthew 25, 41, if you remember, Matthew 25 is the great white throne judgment where all human beings are are before the throne of God and it says that he separates them, the, the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. Okay, so then, this is Jesus talking. He, Jesus is describing this. And he says this in Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on his left, The goats, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So hell, kind of like an eternal prison, was created for the fallen angels. But when human beings fell, we entered into that if we don't allow ourselves to be saved and to be reconciled to God. Okay? That's the big picture. The big picture is there's a God. On on a moral level, there are angels and human beings. Some human beings have been redeemed or are being redeemed and will be able to be in a place called heaven forever. And others who refuse, who have rebelled against God and will not live by his rulership, basically they be put in a place called hell, separated from God's uh, power. And by the way, I look at this as a very practical kind of a thing. We actually do the same thing in human societies. In in normal human societies, or good ones, that have good laws and and so forth, when you obey the the leader, you live by the law, you're you're a good citizen, then you get all the benefits of the empire, right? And of the society. Liken that to heaven. But if you're a criminal and you're unwilling to do that, and you break this law and that law, and you won't give the lawgiver his rightful place, and you won't respect other people, we take those people and we stick them in a place called prison. And the worst, per- the worst c- criminals we put in what we call solitary confinement, which in my opinion is kind of what hell really is. It's being in utter blackness and darkness, the Bible talks about, with your conscience forever. No fellowship. No drinking with your buddies and all that kind of stuff people talk about. No. It's just the fact you've been, having, you've been taken out of the glories of heaven because you were, if you were there, you would make it hell. In the same way, we have to remove criminals from orderly societies. It's the same idea, really. Okay, that's the big picture. So now, <clears throat> let's move on to the three specific questions that were asked. Where is heaven? Where is it as, a, as an actual place? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. And I, I, I kind of put it this way. It could be far away from us, you know, somewhere in the, the known universe that is a place where God rules and his light and his love are, are manifest there. Or it could actually be in another dimension 
that's pretty near to us. Now, in some ways, that makes a little bit more sense because we already know there's another dimension near to us the angels operate in, right? And we have many stories in the Bible about them, you know, def- working with demon spirits and, you know, Daniel and other, uh, them fighting the prince of Persia and all those kinds of things. So we already know there's an unseen realm, we call these extra dimensions, that exist that are closer than we think. So it's either far away or it's close. But J- Jeremy slipped into his little notes uh, an idea. <clears throat> there, there are some scientists today that talk about the extra dimensions of, of life. And so I did a little research and I pulled up a quote for you from a, this is totally a secular, atheistic group. It's called Nova. And, and the writer who wrote the, little, the article is called Rick Grillo. And I want to I share his quote. Now, again, this is totally from a, an atheist point of view, a, a no-God point of view. So I'm going to read his quote to you, and then I'm going to take the quote, and I'm going to change it to the reality of what's true, okay? So here's the quote. And he's, th- these are people who believe there's probably extra dimensions to life. Because, of course, in our life, we have three dimensions. We're three-dimensional beings plus time, time, but we're th- three-dimensional. So here's what... Rick Grillo says, he says, if super string theory turns out to be correct, then the idea of a world consisting of 10 or more dimensions is one that we need to be comfortable with. But will there ever be an explanation or a visual representation of these higher dimensions that will truly satisfy the human mind? Well, the answer to this question may be forever No. Not unless, now pay attention to this sentence, this is an interesting sentence. Not unless some four-dimensional life form pulls us out of our three-dimensional space land and gives us a view of the world from its perspective. Did you get that quote? Okay. Now let's turn it into reality. There probably are a number of dimensions. He says 10 or 11. Who knows? There may be a thousand from God's point of view, but they, scientists say 10 or 11. Mr. Grillo says some it, you know, the only way we could know for sure if this is true, if that it, you know, that maybe is four dimensional, came into the, us three dimensionals and then uh, took us out and we could see from its perspective. Well, here's the truth. The God of the universe, who's more than four dimensional, he's infinite. He steps, he will step into each of our histories one day, and when we die, we are removed from our three dimensions, and we are taken into what we're calling heaven, or eternity. So it's not an it, it's not an alien, it's not, it's God himself is the one who is going to remove us from this world and bring us to another one. Now, What's interesting about that is how many, when you kind of think about heaven sometimes, you got this idea of, you know, harps and tranquility and all that kind of stuff. You know, hey, come on, be honest. You know, you've, you've seen those images and all that. Okay. I actually think heaven is a really busy place, but not in a bad way, but in a good way. <clears throat> and in a good way. Because, for example, last year, you know how many people died last year that, that separated from their bodies and God took them into eternity? into the other sphere, whatever it is, okay, 67 million. That's worldwide. Last year, 2022. That's 183,000 people a day die. And when they die, like my mother-in-law did two months ago, and I was with her right up until near the end, the spirit, the real person, separates from the body. That's the actual meaning of death. Death means to be separated from. So the spirit and soul separate from the body in some way we don't understand that spirit and soul is taken by God, the angels, whatever, into the heavenly world and either deposited in the bad place or the good place. So that's the where. The only other thing that I know about the where is let me give you one verse in um, John 17, verse 1. 
After saying these things, this is a quote from John 17, 1, Jesus looked up to heaven. So if Jesus looks up, it's either closely up or far away up. But he looked up. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so you can give, he can give glory back to you. Okay? So think about that one. Question number two. And this is the most exciting one of today. Question number two is, what is heaven like? What's cool about the Bible is it gives us all kinds of images and stories and references and points of view about eternal, eternal life. So there, there are many portraits, many glimpses. Let me just share a few of them with you, and I hope that really encourages you. The, probably the biggest one in the Bible is the aspect of uh, heaven is a restoration of the Garden of Eden. It's kind of what God all, always intended in the, the beauty and the awesomeness of, of nature. And, and again, I don't have time to go over all these in detail, but just throw them out at you and encourage you. Did you know the word Eden meant delightful? So if you can imagine, <clears throat> you know, the most incredibly beautiful natural setting with colors and everything else, you know, beyond description, that's a, one of the views of heaven. Yeah, similar to that was Luke 23, 43, when Jesus said to the thief on the cross who was reconciled to God at the last moment, Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. So paradise, again, is kind of synonymous with beauty, a garden, wonder, you know, what, whatever you can imagine from a standpoint of paradise. Is it Hawaii? Huh? Uh, is it uh, San Diego? Um, times it by 10,000 or 10 million, you know? And that's what the Bible says heaven is like. The Bible also says it's a place of intimacy and comfort. And this is the story that Jesus told about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And, and the, the Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom. That's a kind of a symbol of closeness, friendship, intimacy. So it's going to be that kind of a place. It's also a place, Revelation 21.4 tells us, that it's a place of, quote, no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And by the way, one of my views of this, especially knowing the godliness of women and some men, is that I think in some ways... God's going to wipe our memories away. He almost has to if there's going to be no more sorrow, crying, or pain. There's going to have to be some change there. It's either a change of perspective or a change of memory. But the Bible makes it clear the former things are, are going to be gone, and you're not going to suffer with them for the, throughout eternity. In Luke 13, 29, we get another image of heaven where Jesus said, People... <coughs> will take their places in the feast of the kingdom of God. It's the, it's the most righteous form of partying you can imagine, okay? Feasting and fellowship. So that's a part of heaven. The other thing I want to kind of throw in here, just kind of as a little bit as a by the way, is there is a present heaven right now, an eternal place of God. We'll get that a little bit further in a moment. But there's also going to be a future one that's different. Because the Bible says both in Isaiah and in Revelation, God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So we do have to kind of distinguish between that. It's, it's actually in, um, let's see in my notes here. <clears throat> it's, it's actually in Philippians 1, 23 and 24 that Paul says emphatically, you know, I, I, I kind of want to die right now so I can go and be with Christ. So again, Heaven in the sense of redeemed people is immediate. You go to be with Jesus. And when my mother-in-law died two months ago, we thought of her seeing Jesus for the first time because that's exactly what Paul said. Okay? But that's kind of a temporary heaven or it's a present heaven. But there's going to be an even better one later on at the end of time. And heaven is also, it's our true home kind of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, you know. That's, that's about salvation, but it's kind of about even eternal salvation. It's the idea of coming home. 
and being blessed by that. Billy Graham said, my home is in heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. And that's a good way to look at it. Lee Strobel said in his wonderful book about the resurrection, he said, if Jesus is to be believed, our death in this world is merely a doorway to a more glorious existence for eternity in the world to come. Okay, time is fleeing away, so I've got to move quickly here. Th- your third question was, why isn't there more about heaven in the Bible? I actually believe there's a lot about heaven in the Bible. But you kind of got to understand how master teaching works. The way a master teacher teaches ideas is they paint a picture from a number of different angles and many different terms. So if some of the angles you don't understand, you get the other ones and you get the concept. Which is why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this. And the kingdom of heaven is like this. And like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. And once you put them all together, you got the concept. That's master teaching. So in the Bible, the Bible uses many different words to teach us about heaven. Because it's <laughs> the master book. So, for example, the word heaven is used quite often, especially in the book of Matthew. And then Beatitudes, which is really all about, here's what life on earth is going to be like, but one day it's going to be like this. That's what all the Beatitudes are. You know, that's where Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, verse 12, your reward is in heaven. He used that term. And in, primarily in the book of Matthew, <clears throat> Jesus talked about God as our Father who is in heaven. There's actually 15 different references to that in the New Testament. Matthew 5.16 is, is one of them. The other major term, the big one, is the kingdom of God. Heaven is where God is king. I mean, God is bigger than the universe. He's a spirit. He's bigger than it all. But he manifests himself and rules in a place called heaven. And that's a good rule, a wonderful rule. So whenever we talk about God's kingdom... Where part of that we're talking about is there, there's this kingdom on earth of those who've given their lives to him, but there's, there's another kingdom somewhere where everything's perfect. That's wonderful, and his rule is being lived out. So Matthew 6.33, seek first his kingdom. And of course, again, I already mentioned the many parables of Jesus. The other phrase we especially find in the Bible about eternity, about heaven, is the term eternal life. Even from famous verses, you know, like John 3.16, And I also mentioned before Matthew 25, the great white throne judgment. In in that particular passage, and by the way, we learn from that passage, you don't want to be left wing, you want to be right wing. No, just kidding, just kidding. But it talks about left and right. Actually, what you want to be is biblical. That's what you want to be. That was a joke. Please uh, strike that from the record. Um, But in that passage, he talks about the bad people are on the left, the good people are on the right, And he mentions there will be eternal life for the righteous, those who have been redeemed, and there will be eternal damnation or separation for those on the left. It's a very, very strong picture using that terminology. Another very beautiful picture that we get in the New Testament is Jesus saying in John 14, 1 to 3, that he's preparing a place for us. I hate to tell you, it's probably not a mansion. That was a kind of a bad translation in the King James, but uh, it, it's a home. It's a place. It'll be wonderful. I mean, probably it'll be better than a mansion. I don't know. But uh, he's preparing a place for us. That's what the, the home analogy is. And, of course, any time the Bible talks about resurrection, and there's a little bit of that in the Old Testament, but a ton of it in the New Testament, the resurrection of the righteous in particular, whenever that's mentioned, it's all talking about the heavenly realm, about heaven. There's actually a whole chapter on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then the Bible ends with two complete chapters about a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, it's just incredible. And especially in that context, heaven is likened to a city coming down from God. Now, for some of us, cities have negative connotations, you know. But kind of in the Bible, it's kind of this. City is kind of the, if you think of the best forms of culture and interaction, coupled with the best beauty of nature and the creation, that's kind of the idea of the ultimate ultimate heaven. Wow, what, what, what a picture. So the Bible does give all kinds of different 
sketches some things about heaven and uses many different words to describe it. But in Jeremy's notes, he emphasizes this, and he's exactly right, is that the Bible actually focuses more on not where we're going, but on what we need to do here. That is true. What do we need to do? We need to repent, which means to change our minds about living selfishly. It means we need to believe, put our trust in Jesus, who atones for our sins. We need to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, live godly lives, not be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. So the New Testament really is, here's how I want you to live to rescue as many people as possible so they can go to that wonderful place. And there are no depressed teenagers because they have a hope, a tremendous hope of heaven. And this is back to Philippians 1, 23 and 24. This is where Paul gave a really wise perspective. He said this. He said, I'm torn between the two, which is the hope of going to where God's love and light rule and staying here. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So again, the imagery there. But it's more necessary for you if I remain here in the body. Because he realized he still had work to do. So Paul longed to be in heaven, but his focus was here because it was necessary to help people. And that's why we're, we're here. He wanted more people to go to heaven, not less. He had one eye on eternity and the other on fulfilling his earthly assignments. That's one thing I've tried to live all of my life. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, what are the assignments for today? What do you want me to do today and tomorrow and in the coming? That's an important thing. So let me, let me finish. I know I've gone quite long. I'm sorry, but I hope this has been helpful. Um, I'm going to finish with a quote that Jeremy put in the notes. It's a quote by a guy named Penn Gillette. Any of you have heard of Penn Gillette? Okay, he's a, he's a ma- magician, but he's a very vocal atheist, okay? And he once said this, quote, I have no love for passive Christians who don't try to reach people for heaven because if you knew someone who was about to get hit by a bus and die and you didn't try to help them, then it's like you're pushing people into the bus. Ooh, that's convicting. And very, very true, spoken by a godless man. So we must focus on helping people become reconciled to God because we want them to get out of the way of the speeding bus of their own sin. Just like we got out of that way through what Jesus did. Jonathan Stone, who's one of the lead pastors of New Life there across the way, in a memorial service one time, <clears throat> he used a great analogy about life. He said this. He said, life is like a 30-second trailer to a movie. And eternal life is the full-length movie, but it never ends. That's really a good imagery, if we can put any imagery to it. And God wants us, he wants you in this room today and me to know, are we going to heaven? And I didn't know when I was nine years old. And God wants us to bring others with us. See this church explode. See all the churches explode with people coming to know him. John 20, 31 says this, These things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life, which is eternal life, in his name. The worship team's going to come up. We're going to finish. And let me tie this into a little communion meditation. We're going to pass out communion here now. And uh, I brought a visual aid for this final little point. It's actually, my visual aid is one of my most important keepsakes. It hangs on a wall in our house. It's probably 
100 years old, at least 90 that I know of. So it's not real pretty. It's old. If you look at it close, it's got some dents and stuff in it. But for decades, Shirley and I have always put it above the place in our home where most people sit so they can actually see it. It's been on the wall for decades. And before us, it was on the wall of my grandparents' home for many, many years. Here's what it says. If I have it right side up. Can you read it? It's kind of faded. Give Christ his right, rightful right place. Give Christ his right place. That's what salvation is. It's simply stopping to be a rebel and become a good citizen (laughs) by turning away from living selfishly, giving Jesus his right place as Savior, Messiah, Creator. And the reason we actually have communion every Sunday here is we want to remember that every single Sunday, that Jesus died for our sins, and because he did that, we can be reconciled to him. And then we want to take that message and help change the world in Mongolia, in other nations, in South Kitsap. But we can only do it if Jesus becomes the king. He has the right place in our lives. Amen? Does he have the right place in your life? That is the question. Are you heaven bound? If in any way, shape, or form you don't know that, you can know it today. I remember the day I knew it for the first time and changed my life. And all of a sudden, one leg of the stool was really secure. And I got the other two secure too in trying to live the life that God had given to me. God wants all of us to have that. Would you bow in prayer? Then we're going to take communion together and we'll finish with a final song. Father, thank you for the wonderful truth of your word. Thank you for the reality of your death and resurrection, which we're going to celebrate right now by having a cracker and juice symbolizing your torture so that we could be forgiven. And Lord, thank you that you've created a place called heaven. And it's a place where we can know you and love you and be all encouraged in a place of staggering beauty and incredible culture for all of eternity. The full-length movie as opposed to this little trailer we're in right now. And it's all because of you. We worship you. Lord, in this church we want to give you your right place. And that is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And Lord, I pray today if there's anybody here in the room who hasn't settled that, help them, draw them right now by your Spirit to lay their lives before you as they take communion and to give you your right place, which is the King, the boss of their life. And I thank you, Lord, you will do that. In Jesus' name, amen. After we sing and finish, if any of you want to talk to me or talk to some of the elders, pray together. We'd love to pray with you. Then let's get out there and share the hope of heaven with a world that desperately needs it.